Juice in Ontario, what's next on the agenda? Uh, we're joined today by over 100 registrants uh, from across the province of Ontario, including those from public health units, community health, not-for-profits, and health associations, as well as OCDPA members. Um, the OCDPA is a collective voice of chronic disease prevention, representing 22 leading health-related non-governmental organizations working together to focus on chronic disease prevention and healthy living in, in a comprehensive manner. Since our establishment in 2003, the OCDPA has been active in supporting advocacy and proposals affecting chronic disease prevention in Ontario, acting as a networking platform and an advisory table for chronic disease prevention across the province of Ontario. Over the last 10 years, we've had a number of successes that have fueled our desire to continue to champion comprehensive chronic disease prevention in Ontario. We've got a couple of new initiatives we'd like to be able to share with you um, and they can all be found on our website which is ocdpa.on.ca score. Um, <laughs> the first one is uh, Dialogue which is a newsletter for uh, chronic disease prevention within Ontario. And the other one is these uh, um, panel discussions that we're having today. I need to flip to the next slide here and uh, talk a bit about the ways uh, by which people are able to connect to the session today. So there are a number of ways for participants to connect. The first is in person and we have uh, an audience in-house at the Canadian Cancer Society which is 55 St. Clair Avenue West in Toronto. I'll just make a very quick note on this as well, that uh, for those of you in the room, the bathrooms are out to, uh, to the right um, and in and around the elevators. Just not, not in the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Okay. So that, that's uh, in person. We also have um, the availability to connect people through live streaming. And this allows participants to watch and listen to the panel in real time via computer. It requires a flash player and it allows people to ask questions and make comments uh, via Twitter. At any point in the presentation, if uh, live streaming stalls, I would ask that you please connect with Adobe Connect and the teleconference line to let us know that that's uh, not working. We also have uh, access through Twitter, so questions and comments can be uh, provided and submitted through Twitter at hashtag number sign OCDPA series through the panel session, uh, and that's by all participants. The OCDPA is also on Twitter, and uh, you can follow us by using the at sign OCDPA. Uh, Adobe Connect as well is, is another mechanism by which people can, can um, use this uh, technology to, to watch the, and participate in the forum. So participants can uh, use the chat function at designated points during the presentations for comments and questions. Uh, you can also use Twitter. Uh, that has no audio, however, and Adobe Connect participants need to call into the teleconference line. Finally, uh, the, the last me mechanism is, th is through teleconference and the lines you will find through it, um, this discussion today will be muted and unmuted at the times when participants are asked to respond to questions or provide comments. If you're experiencing any problems at all throughout this session, we would ask that you um, try to reach, reach out to us through Twitter, um, through uh, Ustream or Adobe as we move forward. The next slide is very quick. I just want to emphasize that uh, that we have uh, looked at a, a couple of different panel discussions to date. Uh, we started off looking at mental health promotion and chronic disease. Then we move forward to high risk alcohol consumption. Today we're looking at uh, tobacco. In um, in March we're looking at healthy eating, and in May we're looking at active living and physical activity. So we would encourage you all to join us uh, for those sessions as well. We're hoping that these panel discussions uh, really encourage and initiate discussion on a number of questions that John's going to go through in just a bit. The focus of these panel discussions is to really explore what action is currently underway 
and what still needs to happen in order to adequately and effectively address chronic disease risk factors in Ontario. Um, we also will make a note that we will have a, a culminating event in uh, the fall of 2013 around um, chronic disease prevention, looking at all of these uh, discussions that we've had to date and pulling them together. The last thing I'll leave you with very, very quickly is that we, on our website, uh, we have a, a number of documents that um, that uh, sort of set a framework and a foundation for uh, some of the discussions that we're having here today as well as the, the efforts of the OCDP as a whole. The first one is thinking like a system which um, sets out a proposed model for by which a, a province uh, can look at a, a system that enables effective coordinated planning and delivery and improvement of health promotion and chronic disease prevention at a population level. Uh, the other one is, a, is called the Toolkit for Healthy Communities, Influencing Healthy Public Policies. And this uh, toolkit really looks at uh, supporting those uh, local leaders who want to engage uh, their communities in um, making change at a local level. So again, visit our website to get some more information on that. So with that, and with uh, this last introduction, uh, I'd like to pass it off to John, then, who will be the moderator for our session today. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I, my name is John Atkinson, and I'm a Senior Manager in uh, Public Affairs here at the Canadian Cancer Society. So really pleased to see uh, the faces in the room, welcome, and uh, also welcome to all of those online and on the phone. So very quickly, uh, we have two main objectives. They're pretty broad today. One is to increase the understanding of tobacco control initiatives currently happening or on the next, uh, on the frontier, I guess, the next frontier uh, in Ontario. And secondly is really, uh, and this is where we will have some dialogue and question and answer and hopefully some stimulating discussion um, around opportunities to take collaborative action um, in the areas of protection, prevention, and cessation. So our agenda, um, if you can imagine if you're watching, uh, you know, the camera does not allow for us to have an actual panel sitting in a row, but each panelist, we're going to have a panel of a total of five speakers, um, but they'll, uh, our, our second set of speakers, so we'll have two pairs of speakers talking about uh, two different topics, and they will uh, come up one after the other, um, and then we will follow with a Q&A, um, and we will have some facilitated discussion around some questions, which I'm going to put up on the screen, um, and then uh, I will wrap it up, um, and we will say adieu, and, uh, and then I'll tell you, or au revoir. Adieu is permanent. Adieu is permanent, um, I was just told. So, au revoir, or hasta luego, until next time, um, and so thank you very much from the first speaker, so you know who's, uh, who's speaking to me. So um, <laughs> there are a number of uh, key questions which um, I'd like to flag for you right now so you can think about them as we go through each of the panel presenters today. Um, and so the first question is, and so what I'd really like for people to, to prepare and think about as we present today is, is to share your thoughts whether you're, we're going to unmute the folks on the phone. Uh, we do want to hear from you and we are going to be taking questions via Twitter um, and Ustream uh, and Adobe Connect that we can um, take not only questions but comments, answers to these questions. So the first one is what are the main action steps needed within the w next one to two years for government, for the Ontario Chronic Disease Prevention Alliance, uh, for researchers, uh, and for each of your individual organizations or individual organizations within this sector um, in terms of tobacco control and what's next on the agenda. Uh, second is what are the major challenges or barriers that impede these actions? So what do we really need to think about, consider, and find solutions as we go, um, as we move forward together? And finally, um, uh, obviously, how do we minimize those? So obviously, we'll have, you'll have lots of great solutions uh, by the end, but how do we also minimize these barriers um, as we go along? So we have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, five presenters. 
and uh, you can see from the screen who will be presenting, but I'll introduce them as we go through. Um, so we might as well uh, get started with the first person, and that's Michael Purley. Um, so I'd like to welcome Michael Purley. Uh, Michael is the director of the Ontario Campaign uh, for Action on Tobacco, and Michael has spent nearly 35 years in the field of environmental and public ad advocacy, public health advocacy. Um, after a short stint as executive director of the Canadian Environmental Law Research Foundation, Michael Halp found the Canadian Coalition on Acid Rain in 1980. Uh, he was the coalition's co-executive coordinator until 1990, and the coalition success successfully lobbied for reductions in acid rain causing emissions in both the United States and Canada uh, during that time. Uh, Michael joined the Ontario ca Campaign for Action on Tobacco in 93 and on behalf of the Ontario um, medical and public health communities uh, he has led the campaign's efforts to help pass the Ontario Tobacco Control Act which was proclaimed in 1994 and the Smoke Free Ontario Act which came into force in 2006. Michael has also helped lead successful campaigns to ban smoking in cars, transporting children, and to pass legislation enabling health care cost recovery litigation against the tobacco industry. Most recently, his work contributed to the passage of the Supporting uh, Smoke Free Ontario by Reducing Contraband Act. That's a long title for that act, um, which received royal assent in June 2012. And earlier today, I congratulated Michael, but Michael was awarded the 2012 Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for his work in tobacco control. So without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Michael Purley. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, it's nice to be here, and uh, shout out to everybody online. Uh, it's uh, uh, good that we don't all have to come into the mess that, uh, that is Toronto uh, to come to a meeting like this anymore. Uh, I'm sure everyone is uh, online is relieved. So uh, good on you for uh, joining us, and it's uh, a really interesting opportunity today to have uh, all these different chronic disease vectors looked at. Um, I'd like, before I start on uh, my topic, which is the idea of smoke-free outdoor spaces, um, I'd like to mention a couple of things you may be interested in. Uh, for those of you who are working on the nutrition issue, I'm sure there are many of you uh, here who have something to do with nutrition. Um, the Ontario Medical Association did a paper, which y you may be familiar with or not. Um, I think it was in the on October issue of the Ontario Medical Review, which is their um, uh, standard publication on transferability of lessons from tobacco control to the childhood obesity issue. And if you haven't already seen it, uh, I worked on it, several other people worked on it. We tried to look at the last 20 years of tobacco control advocacy and then the, the state of the childhood obesity issue and the industry that's partly behind it um, and uh, see what's transferable to uh, the food sector and the childhood obesity sector from tobacco control. So that may be of something of interest to you. Um, there's also another emerging phenomenon which is not in my remit today, but it's uh, a critical one, e-cigarettes or electronic cigarettes. It's another big tobacco control issue. We may be hearing about it from Peter and Donna, uh, <laughs> possibly. But um, I encourage you, if you didn't hear The Current this morning on CBC with Anna Maria Tremonti, um, there was a segment between 9.30 and 10 interviewing uh, Melody Tilson from the Non-Smokers Rights Association, uh, which is having a forum tomorrow here in Toronto on e-cigarettes, the first national forum of its kind. And uh, a physician from Alberta who has a company that makes non-nicotine-based e-cigarettes. And they had a very interesting debate and it covered pretty well all the issues. It didn't solve them all by any means, but it covered all the issues currently around e-cigarettes. So some of you may be coming across this issue in your work as well. They're proliferating like mad. They're probably the fastest growing, I'll just say tobacco related sector in North America. Um, there are many questions about them. So if you're interested in the issue, it's a very good discussion, about 25 minutes long. It's online, cbc.ca slash the current. Uh, so worthwhile checking out. So those are my two uh, little promos, uh, if I may. And uh, what I'd like to speak about primarily today is outdoor smoke-free spaces advocacy. 
Um, I'm not going to talk about smoke -free, outdoor smoke-free spaces as the area in tobacco control where we're likely to get the most specific health gains. It's the area which is getting the most attention and activity at the local level. Um, there are probably, in terms of direct health benefits, areas of tobacco control which could get us more quicker uh, than outdoor smoke-free spaces advocacy and outdoor smoke-free spaces policies, bylaws, laws, etc. But because of the frequency of activity, many, many municipalities are looking at or have passed smoke-free bylaws for their outdoor areas. And because of the potential to help us in the protection area, that's why I'd like to talk about it today. Um, so there are a number of reasons to in fact pass a smoke-free outdoor bylaw and this is where the action is these days at the municipal level it's the same place we were oh gosh uh, 16 or 17 years ago provincially where we had uh, a provincial government that was not interested in tobacco control but many municipalities were and they had the authority to pass smoke-free workplace and public place bylaws some of you may be veterans of that uh, fight, uh, series of fights that went on, and they were fights. Uh, but now we've moved beyond that. We have smoke-free workplace and public place policies in place at the provincial level. So many, many municipalities are looking at their outdoor areas. And why do we do this? Well, there is a direct exposure issue in some settings. Um, there's no safe level of exposure to any tobacco smoke, including secondhand smoke. It, it contains a great many chemicals. Um, 50, at least 50 uh, known cancer-causing substances. It can be a hazard to some younger children, particularly in outdoor settings, if they're close to it and they're exposed to it. Um, the main thing that I think of is the po potential to trigger an asthma attack. I remember one uh, debate we had uh, at uh, a municipal council to the northwest of Toronto some years ago where a mom brought her, I think he was about 11 years old, and his tray of asthma medications, and it was a tray. And she set it down in front of council, and their son was there and said, this is what, if I took, am to take my son to play hockey at the arena here in Georgetown, this is what I have to have in the car in case somebody's smoking out in front of the arena and he gets a whiff of it because that can trigger an asthma attack. And he was very sensitive, and there were a number of different meds that she could use depending on the severity of the attack. So that's an example of the kind of direct exposure issue in an outdoor setting. You could call it an entryway setting, uh, where, where a particularly young child and potentially with a few <coughs> medical conditions can be triggered. So um, it can be affected by circumstances in the sense of not every exposure is the same. It's not as consistent as it is or was in bars and restaurants, but there can be a direct health effect. So that's one reason to implement a smoke-free bylaw. Now, second, and I think uh, Peter may have uh, comments on this as well, and Donna, uh, it increases, the less normal smoking is, the less omnivisual it is, the less omnipresent it is in outdoor settings. Particularly now we have indoor smoke-free spaces, so more smokers tend to smoke outside. It, if there are restrictions in certain outdoor settings, it can increase the motivation to quit, or at least to cut back or start thinking about. Um, we know that uh, stats can, through StatsCan research that um, smoke-free indoor policies, which can then influence behavior indoor in the home, can then lead to many people quitting. I mean, this is not sort of rocket science. It's inevitable that this would happen. But um, it can also uh, be a case of the indoor policy, if it's matched by an outdoor policy, at least in many settings, uh, the motivation to quit is further increased. So there's no doubt, I think, that there's value uh, from that motivational side, quite apart from the direct exposure side, in having outdoor smoke-free policies. Maybe I'm not reaching. Huh? Ah. No signal. Okay. Sorry, we're just having a one of life's inevitable technical glitches. Oh, is there a slideshow? I think that's on. 
Uh, let me just go back one. There we are. Okay, good. Back in business. So um, there's also a real question, and there always is in tobacco control, about what is the image that society wants to present to younger people about tobacco use. It's not, we don't want it to be normal. We don't want it to be um, <clears throat> an attractive behavior in the sense of cool, risky, edgy, any of that. Uh, we certainly, just in terms of a pure health behavior, we don't want adults or anyone modeling in front of kids a behavior where there's no safe level of use of the product that forms part of the behavior. So um, the less kids see and the less younger people see of adults smoking, the less normal they'll think it is. And uh, if they're aware um, that uh, in certain areas, particularly like playgrounds and sports fields and so on, where one goes to improve one's health and enjoy oneself outside, uh, the less association there is between that and um, tobacco use, the better. Uh, now, we have nine of ten smokers starting before the age of 20. Um, the tobacco industry depends on young recruits to uh, re 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 replace the smokers who quit or die as a result of their addiction. Uh, the tobacco industry has to get these young people. So it's very important uh, if we're to be successful in the long term uh, with this younger crowd, we have to be very careful to make sure that an image of normalcy and uh, regularity and acceptability is not attached or is attached as little as possible to tobacco use. And we want to not have a situation where kids on the one hand get all kinds of anti-smoking <laughs> messages at school and at home and so on and then they go to the soccer field and there are five or six people standing around smoking. Uh, that is not the kind of mixed message we want at all for our kids. So that's another reason, uh, the modeling, to remove the modeling to young people. Um, then there is a, an environmental uh, dimension to this, and it's getting a little more attention these days. Uh, you'll see that the 06 litter study in Toronto um, found that a little over 16% of the litter collected in this sample audit of trash in Toronto on the streets was cigarette butts. And they're, of course, non-biodegradable. Uh, they, the absence of cigarette butts will will increase, or sorry, decrease uh, municipal cleanup costs somewhat. Um, and there are, if you can believe it, I found this astonishing when I first came across it. But there are actual toxic exposures. Um, little kids can just pick up cigarette butts and eat them, and they're of course full if they're filtered. They have filters in them of uh, very toxic tar. Uh, and uh, a little child uh, eating one or two of those, you can imagine the kind of upset that would occur. Um, so there are toxic exposures, not a massive number, but it's just another reason among many uh, to get rid of uh, this kind of litter. And uh, to, uh, by do, uh, having a smoke-free outdoor bylaw to help reduce that. And then smoke, uh, reduced fire risk. Uh, this is a problem. The more we expand into the out of doors, uh, the more we increase the possibility that wooded areas, parks and so on, particularly in, in, in uh, urban areas or in, in, in inhabited areas, are less likely to have fires as a result of cigarettes being tossed away. So yet another reason. So there are a number of reasons to do this. And one only is really, well, not, not only the only direct health uh, impact uh, related uh, reason, but one is the, the primary reason, which is the direct exposure, but uh, from a health point of view. But I would say from, from my point of view and from ours at the Ontario campaign, we look at this as a denormalization strategy as opposed to a direct health impact st a strategy. So another one that's really important is uh, another area outdoors are patios. And uh, in order to uh, just summarize this for you quickly, I wanted to summarize the arguments that worked with Kingston City Council, Kingston, Ontario, in 2003, 10 years ago. So a lot well before uh, the Smoke Free Ontario Act was passed, after a number of bylaws had come in, but before we had provincial legislation. So we weren't as far advanced in this area then as we are now. And yet, here are the arguments that worked 
for Kingston. Now, Kingston, for those who haven't been there, um, it's a university town, it's a tourism town, lots of bars, lots of restaurants, lots of patios. So this isn't some little village somewhere that really, you know, if you were to say, well, Kingston's patios have gone smoke-free, the answer might be, so what, they only have one. This is not at all the kind of uh, municipality that Kingston is. So this was a major step forward. And the, uh, the no safe level of exposure issue was critical. The feeling they needed a level playing field because they were moving to a smoke-free uh, bar and restaurant bylaw. And they felt that all hospitality premises should be the same. And uh, the industry in many respects agrees with that um, uh, rationale. Then protection of workers. And on patios, you get a higher issue or a more serious issue to do with direct exposure because you have workers coming in and going out of the restaurant and uh, in many patio settings they're somewhat enclosed or, or close together uh, so if you have a lot of people smoking on patios if it's a if it's a still day and depending on the configuration you can have some pretty major exposure of patrons but also of workers not quite at what it is in a smoky used to be rather in a smoky bar but, but getting up there. So a much more direct occupational health hazard for workers on patios. Um, and then action had begun to be taken in other jurisdictions. So those are the issues and the arguments that worked for Kingston. And uh, that was 10 years ago. Uh, we have a ways to go uh, yet. Um, these are some of the issues that come up typically uh, against economic impact. Oh, it'll put all the uh, uh, you know, restaurants that have them or bars that have them out of business. And this is exactly the same argument we heard about during all or virtually all the municipal uh, bylaw debates in the late latter part of the 90s and early 2000s. And none of it was ever subsequently proven true. Uh, we have never had one single economic impact study that shows that there was any definable uh, generalizable impact in any municipality or across Ontario, not one. Are there individual restaurants or bars that whose business dipped and varied? Probably. Uh, can we prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that happened? No. The best example I remember was uh, in Waterloo, which brought in Waterloo Region brought in the first smoke-free bar and restaurant bylaw in 2000. And uh, there was a prominent bar owner who made a lot of noise about the disastrous economic impact that this was going to cause his bar. And uh, so they brought in the bylaw and uh, some, I don't know whether it was a year after it came in, but a, sort of a, a while after, he was asked to bring his statements for the year before the bylaw came in and the year after. And it turned out he made more money in the year after than he did the year before. And so that was one example of, of when somebody's asked, when the rubber is asked to hit the road, uh, the rubber doesn't do very well. Uh, so we've never seen any. We've looked for it, uh, evidence, because we'd want to know about it. If it was there, it's not there. But the feeling is, and it's very hard to dissuade city councillors from the fact that they may not know their municipality as well as they think they do, or they may not know this issue in its manifestation in Peel or wherever, uh, as well as others do, um, the fact remains, it's not identifiable. Uh, it creates an unequal playing field. We have a big outdoor bylaw coming in in Peel region um, shortly. And the councillors from a couple of the municipalities, particularly Mississauga, which abuts Toronto, are saying, well, you know, if we make patios smoke free, all the, all the patio smokers are gonna go to Toronto. If they may, it, it, because uh, they'll be able to smoke the patios in Toronto. And this is an extension of the apparent belief that people who go out to bars or restaurants only go to smoke. So if they can't smoke, they won't go to a bar, they won't go to a restaurant, they won't go to a patio. And this is the argument we kept hearing again in the, in the 90s. Um, and it did such a disservice and was sort of, I found it, if I were a smoker, I would have been pretty insulted. Like, that you think that's the only reason I go out? I don't go out to meet my friends, I don't go out to play darts, I don't go out to watch a football game, I don't go out to socialize, I just go out to smoke. Like, my life's pretty limited if that's all the reason I have for going out. 
So that unequal playing field argument, we've never seen, again, any evidence of any migration back and forth. There are many municipalities that went before others in the 90s, and there was no sense of herds of smokers driving from Essex County to somewhere else, you know. Uh, it just never happened. And then the, the, the one that was more industry inspired and we haven't heard much of lately is there's no health evidence that there's a serious problem with exposure to secondhand smoke, which is just nonsense. But that does, it did come up quite frequently. Those are the main argument areas that come up against patios. Um, we're going to ultimately need a provincial solution to this. Uh, municipality by municipality by municipality, it's really uh, not a very efficient way to do this. The province is, is afraid of potential controversy, uh, which again proves that in most cases governments lag behind the population in terms of their attitudes about issues. Uh, and in this one, despite all the progress the current administration has made over ten, nearly 10 years now on tobacco control, they're still afraid of doing this province-wide. We hope to change that, but we'll have, we'll have some work to do on this. Um, a few implementation issues. Um, enforcement. Uh, this is some a discussion we've had at Peel uh, Region, uh, the committee uh, that, that is preparing this bylaw. We've discussed <coughs> enforcement a great deal. A uh, number of councillors have gone uh, to uh, the staff and said, you know, we really have to have an effective enforcement plan and we can't let this become a, a scoff law. <coughs> And in fact, the experience shows going back to Woodstock a number of years ago, which was the first municipality in Ontario to bring in a major smoke-free outdoor <coughs> bylaw, it's largely self-enforcing. What the municipality is doing really, especially today, with the norm being smoke-free indoors, is giving people who are used to that uh, permission to say to somebody who may be smoking in a restricted area, like, could you put that out, please? You see the sign here? So you put up signs. And the signs with the bylaw number and so on, which you see in Toronto and you see various places uh, where this has been put in place. Um, the signs make it clear that this is the policy, this is official, and it gives people a chance to say, uh, not sort of, I want to get into a confrontation with you about this, but you see the sign, uh, the <laughs> municipality says there's no smoking here and I'd appreciate it if you'd, you'd abide by it. So they can blame the municipality. And that's how much of this becomes largely self-enforcing. You have a social marketing campaign, you have an informational campaign to start off. That's what we're going to do in Peel. But uh, you don't need hordes of uh, tobacco enforcement officers out patrolling the playgrounds and parks because people get it at this point with the indoor restrictions and uh, you get the odd person, uh, especially around sports arenas who don't like this, uh, maybe more than the odd person, uh, but not hordes and we haven't seen any confrontations of any significant magnitude. Um, an accompanying cessation campaign. Uh, this is an area that sort of bewilders me a little bit because anytime one of these bylaws comes in, it's a wonderful opportunity given the number of cessation services we have, the Canadian Cancer Society Smokers Helpline, the STOP program through CAMH, family health teams offering NRT, pharmacists counseling, ODB recipients getting medications. I won't steal Peter's thunder, but there are tons of interventions and ways to get help. And to not offer them and promote them at the same time you bring this byline is really missing, missing the boat in a couple of ways. It's missing the boat to help people uh, quit, just purely on health grounds, but it's also missing the municipality itself if it's worried about controversy and it's worried about appearing big brother or big sister-ish. The best way to round off those edges is to offer smokers help. If this encourages you to think about quitting, here's how we can help. Here's how the Region Appeal suggests you take advantage of this or that service, and there's a phone line, and da 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 da. And uh, I don't know whether that's a widely accepted strategy, which is strange. It should be. Um, where do smokers go? Uh, this, I think, at, in the longer run as we go along here, this is going to be the issue. Uh, so people now can't smoke indoors, so they come outside of their workplace building, whether it's a factory or an office building or whatever, 
they won't be able they they so entryways are a real issue uh, for many people um, if they can't go into parks playgrounds sports fields um, then they have entryways public sidewalks outside the home and past that the number of places where people can actually smoke diminishes so this is an effort to narrow the funnel if you like to make it more difficult to smoke easily uh, and encourage more people hopefully to uh, think about quitting if they haven't already and start down that road um, we're going to get to a point where we're going to have a, a hard core of hard highly addicted group we have we have a, a highly addicted subgroup or groups now and again Peter and Donna will talk about this I'm sure um, but um, we have not yet really figured out how to how to reach those folks first and how to how to encourage them to quit and they will be some people who feel increasingly put upon as outdoor smoke-free spaces proliferate and how we deal with them I'll leave that to uh, uh, Peter and Donna to solve that little problem um, so public building entrances next to parking lots long-term care residences this is an area uh, where we have trouble bad weather uh, settings shelters do we need shelters does that normalize smoking again how are the shelters built these are just some of the issues but we're going to have to address that now these are a few of the bylaws I mentioned Woodstock which did playgrounds and sports fields five years ago uh, seems like a lot longer than that um, these are some of the uh, uh, other municipalities and it just gives you a flavor the only reason I did this list is just to give you a flavor of the kinds of outdoor settings that people have tended to go to municipalities have tended to go to um, they're pretty the Ottawa is pretty well the most comprehensive one um, all our outdoor areas are municipal properties uh, restaurant and bar patios uh, and they've had no trouble by the way and Ottawa is another big tourist town with a lot of anybody who's been to the Byward market you know how many patios there are there uh, tons and uh, they've had no trouble at all and the a number of owners have testified in the media about that uh, Hamilton Perry Sound Perry Sound's coming up that'll be an interesting one uh, especially with the bikers showing up in July as they usually do we'll see how that goes um, Timmins coming up not yet done <coughs> Prince Edward County uh, bylaws coming in at the local level there so you can see how it's spreading and uh, I think it's pretty clear this is a trend that's going to continue to chug along maybe pick up some speed um, but uh, that is it um, uh, on on this matter I think uh, I hope that gives you a good flavor of the issue and why it's important uh, but again uh, there are a number of other interventions which probably will give us more direct specific time limited definable health impacts but this one is an extremely important environmental uh, first and foremost an environmental and attitudinal intervention as as well as a health intervention so uh, I hope that's been helpful and look forward to discussion later thank you very much Michael um, I think it's helpful and, and I'd like to hear when we get to the question period to hear uh, uh, hear it laid out in the way that you did in terms of the reasons why the arguments against uh, the cases as to you know where where have trails been blazed uh, to give people examples of what can be done or or how people can hook into or support some of the work being done at a local level so that's helpful thank you so our next two presenters um, are Cale Brown and Sarah Butson uh, so Cale Brown is a community li liaison officer from Ottawa Public Health uh, he's worked across Canada in youth tobacco prevention and cessation, uh, developing in innovative advocacy campaigns to stop the tobacco industry. His academic background in business, coupled with a drive for working with youth, motivates him to continue to push towards a more inclusive and effective tobacco control environment. Sarah Butson uh, is the provincial manager uh, for the in the Ontario Lung, Lung Association for their Youth Advocacy Training Institute. Uh, her academic, professional and personal experiences have allowed her the opportunity to work with youth both nationally and internationally within education settings, chronic disease and tobacco prevention programs and in research and evaluation. 
Her experiences working with youth continue to inspire and excite her about the motivation and capacity that young people have to create change. She holds a master's in science uh, in educational research from the University of Manchester in England. So I would like to welcome Cale Brown and Sarah Butson. John. Uh, so uh, today we're really going to be taking you through, let's see if I can use this, uh, youth tobacco prevention. We're going to start with a bit of an overview of what some of the better practice is with respect to youth tobacco prevention. Uh, and then we're going to ground that in some community examples that are going on across the province. And then we're going to explore um, as a group, you know, what are the next steps and how do we move forward um, together in terms of getting uh, low tobacco initiation rates amongst youth. So I'm just going to start off and go uh, through a little bit of where we are now, uh, the current situation. So uh, this year the government federally has uh, cut significantly the tobacco control budget, uh, which once again puts more emphasis on the need for us in tobacco control uh, and health to work together on these issues to tackle them effectively uh, and reduce our smoking rate. Uh, Ontario, once again, though, has committed to keeping their tobacco control environment the way it is and still maintains that uh, we want to still be able to do what we're able to doing right now in uh, prevention, protection, and cessation. Uh, in prevention, so far, we've seen great results. Uh, as we all know, our smoking rates for everyone across Canada have been going down over the years. Uh, but what we seem to notice is that it starts to slow. Uh, and even in some of our populations, such as young adult, we've seen an increase. So once again, there's still a need there uh, for prevention and uh, the need might be shifting in population, but again, the need is still there. Uh, some of the things we've been able to do in prevention have been very impressive. Uh, 1.1 fewer, 1.1 million fewer smokers uh, throughout Canada. And again, uh, the strategy for tobacco control far outweighs the benefits of not having one. So it, again, uh, cost effectiveness of keeping these strategies is very good. Uh, this is just a quick depiction of our youth and young adult smoking rates. So primarily what uh, my background is working in prevention, we do a lot of work with the youth and young adult populations. Uh, on the top we have the Canadian rates and on, or sorry, young adult rates uh, and the lower two bars are actually the youth rates. So as we see young adults a bit higher, uh, and again, we see that consistently, our Ontario rates have been lower than what we see across Canada. So what does that tell us? We're doing something good in tobacco prevention uh, in Ontario. And again, keeping that commitment is really important to doing that. Uh, we see here that the tobacco industry is still a very powerful industry, although there are not as many smokers across Canada. Uh, the tobacco industry still has a lot of money and the ability they want to keep their customer base. Uh, as we see here, there's still lots of cigarettes, 28 million, 500,000, or sorry, 28 billion, 500 million um, cigarettes being sold in Canada in 2008. Uh, so the industry is still there, it still exists, and it's still a big part of tobacco control, and that's why we need to address it uh, with comprehensive prevention, cessation, and protection strategy. So when we're exploring youth tobacco prevention, we're going to be really looking today at a strategy known as tobacco industry denormalization, which uh, folks in the room may be uh, more or less familiar with. Um, and we're going to start by just looking at some of the key components that make tobacco industry denormalization uh, unique and then talk about why it is effective when it comes to youth tobacco prevention. So some of the components that make it unique <coughs> include so one of the things we do is move away from blaming the victim. So uh, we focus in the denormalization part uh, that a person who smokes, uh, they're partly the victim of the tobacco industry who intensely markets to them. Uh, and we don't want to blame, we don't want to be against smokers. We're very inclusive. Uh, we want to include them and then allow them to be a part of our different prevention efforts. Uh, in the picture here is a group in Ottawa that I worked with. Uh, we did a little bit of uh, cessation throughout the university campuses, again going and saying we're not against smokers, uh, we want to work with you. Uh, you were targeted by a tobacco industry and there are other supports there uh, to be able to help you to quit. So another component that makes this strategy a little bit different and what's evidenced here um, through this, what we would refer to as a counter ad, um, is you know, looking at unwrapping kind of the, the industry tactics uh, 
you know, pun intended, looking at, you know, what are these products really and who are they really targeting? Um, and so in that sense, it tells the truth about the tobacco industry's role as a disease vector, but it also, as was touched on in uh, the presentation by Michael, talks about the normalcy and it challenges the normalcy and the legitimacy of that product. Um, the final piece that really makes this strategy distinct is that it really is about advocating for change. And as Kale mentioned, it's not about blaming the victim. It's a strategy that is one that all folks can get on board about uh, and can be committed to creating some change. So in this example, we have um, a group of youth uh, around the Flavor Gone campaign, which we'll get into momentarily really advocating in, in this picture. They've got styrofoam cups that they've spelt out uh, their campaign across. Um, so it, it really is a way of, of garnering all efforts together. So we're going to take a step back for a few moments and we really wanted to explore uh, the better practice when it comes to youth tobacco prevention. And we have to start that by talking about uh, this concept of knowledge equaling healthy behavior because sometimes our instincts are to tell someone uh, it's bad for you, don't do it, uh, or it will be bad for you, don't do it. Uh, and we know that knowledge doesn't always have that impact around healthy behavior. If it did, we wouldn't jump out of airplanes, uh, we wouldn't do a lot of things that are, you know, unhealthy behaviors. Um, and we know particularly from the research that telling youth that 20, 30 years down the road, there will be long-term negative impacts is not an incredibly effective strategy and in fact in some cases can actually be detrimental. Uh, what makes tobacco industry denormalization interesting as a strategy is that the knowledge that's being conveyed is it a different type of knowledge. Instead, the knowledge that we're focused on is one of deconstructing media messages, it's one of skill acquisition, it's one of getting the capacity to uh, advocate and create change against things that you believe are unjust. So the knowledge is still there, but what is actually being conveyed is a very different message um, and one that is more effective when delivered in that way. We also wanted to highlight two other kind of thematic components of better practice and we want to, uh, in a little while when we get to the community-based examples, really highlight how tobacco industry denormalization as a strategy is one that allows us to also hit on these other components of better practice. The first one is really around <coughs> comprehensive approaches to tobacco prevention. What the literature suggests is that when we institute tobacco prevention strategies alongside policy changes or ones that suggest policy changes and thinking about some of the protection components that were mentioned in, in uh, Michael's presentation, that they tend to be more effective. Um, but also when they include community partners, so you know, looking at the folks in the room but also the community at broad because youth tobacco prevention isn't just a youth issue. Um, and then approaches that are not one size fits all but that are in fact targeted approaches and I think we'll see from the examples that we're going to highlight that tobacco industry denormalization really allows us to do some of these components. The final piece and certainly not um, left to last uh, for reason is that <coughs> that concept of youth engagement as a model. So integrating into our strategies the idea of sort of a not for us without us. So not implementing youth tobacco strategies for youth that don't include youth at every level of that table in as meaningful a way as possible so that they're involved in the planning, the implementation, the development, and the evaluation of those strategies. Um, and we know that they're more effective when they also tap into some of those social networks because when they're engaged in that way, uh, their voice can be a lot louder. Uh, and then they implement those peer-to-peer -peer approaches. So talked about the type of knowledge and the type of message that's conveyed through tobacco industry denormalization, but it's also important to think about who's giving that message. Um, and it's important when that comes from that peer-to-peer -peer approach. So as we see, tobacco industry <laughs> denormalization as an approach has worked, and it's been effective in Ontario uh, through the strategy we've run for the last six or seven years uh, in youth tobacco convention all across the province. Um, we see some of the amazing things up on the slide here that the youth have been able to do uh, working under tobacco industry denormalization as an approach. Um, and some of the youth, again, once they get that opportunity to be empowered and speak on the issues and being involved in that policy work uh, and actually making change uh, for Ontario, 
uh, they're very happy to be involved in that process. And we see here we've had some uh, youth representatives in the federal house. Uh, Stephen Harper's even met with uh, some youth on tobacco issues. Again, uh, politicians and youth want to be involved uh, because tobacco is an issue that affects youth a lot uh, because they're being the ones being targeted and they want to be very vocal that that's not okay with them. So we're going to route uh, some of these examples through some community-based examples and what we've chosen to highlight um, in our presentation is Action Week. And so for folks that aren't familiar with Action Week, Action stands for Advocates Challenging the Tobacco Industry Now. And it uh, literally is a week of coordinated uh, effort and action amongst uh, youth and adults across the province. Um, this year, the focus for that action was around tobacco industry denormalization. And I, I do want to take a moment just to thank all of the public health units and other organizations that did help to build um, and share their, their successes and their experiences in helping us build this presentation. Uh, so youth focused on tobacco industry denormalization, some focused on three uh, key campaigns, and then other organizations and other groups did a more cross-cutting approach. I do encourage you to check out um, actionweek.ca for some of those other approaches that were taken, but we're going to focus on uh, three of the campaigns and explore how they kind of implemented that better practice. Uh, so we're going to start with the first one, and I believe we have a video. Uh, if we can cue starring Kale Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go get some smokers. It's important to know as much as possible about teenage smoking habits. Today's teenager is tomorrow's potential customer. We in the business of selling nicotine, an addictive drug. We were targeting kids, and at the time I thought it was unethical and maybe even illegal, but I was told it was company policy. We killed 50% of our market. We need to shift our focus elsewhere. It's our business at the high school student. If you really and truly aren't going to sell the kids, we'll be out of business in 30 years. The fragile developing self-image of the young person needs all the support and enhancement it can get. Smoking may appear to enhance that self-image. Though we do not like our opponents, it would be foolish to underestimate them. They are clever. Go, friend. Cherry skulls for somebody who likes the taste of candy. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, they got lips. We want them. We've been asked by our client to come up with a new, exciting package design. One that's attractive to kids. We'll accept the no smoking policy for elevators if you have to pass something. <laughs> Tobacco is no more addictive than gummy bears. We're not going to support a youth smoking program that discourages you from smoking. The night's forecast. A freeze is coming. <laughs> So that video, a little bit of a caveat so you understand what was going on. Uh, <laughs> um, apparently I'm a little better in front of that camera, obviously great acting by everyone there. Um, uh, so that video was actually called Stuff the Tobacco Industry Says. So those were all actually tobacco industry quotes that they've said throughout the years, taken through tobacco industry documents, different litigation in the States. Uh, and then we got different youth from around Ottawa that wanted to participate in that video. And we made a video just saying stuff that the tobacco industry executives say. And if anyone uh, is big up on YouTube, they know that there are a lot of videos about stuff people say. So uh, we kind of did a parody of that. And again, uh, what I want to reiterate with these types of videos is that we did this uh, to be edgy. And it's something that's a little different that we don't see in a lot of our cessation and prevention camp uh, protection campaigns is this uh, piece that kind of targets youth directly and makes it edgy and something that you don't see everywhere else. Uh, so kind of playing off these viral videos and uh, leveraging some of our other methods to access youth other than the traditional newspaper or website type thing, uh, getting out there and actually making something to engage youth in a different and meaningful way. Uh, so a little bit about the Freeze the Industry campaign itself. Uh, this one was actually started a couple years ago uh, in, in Ottawa in the eastern region of Ontario. So uh, in It's Just Grow, we had our first provincial conference this year. Uh, Again, a youth from all across Ontario got together uh, in Toronto and discussed tobacco issues, specifically the Freeze the Industry campaign. Uh, the Freeze the Industry campaign looks, uh, is looking to pass a tobacco moratorium in Canada. So 
One of the big things that youth identified as an issue were all these products that are targeting them. So we heard it with Flavor Gone Campaign. Flavors are targeting all these new products. Uh, we'll hear probably later a little bit about e-cigarettes, uh, different things like snus that has been introduced in Canada, chew tobacco, uh, just the things the tobacco industry does to their products uh, and their branding to just directly target and market to youth. You said that's not okay, we need to do something about this. So. Uh, this is what we created was the freeze the industry campaign and again we're looking to freeze the industry so uh, passing federal legislation that would make sure they're not allowed to market and these new products in Canada uh, so we're not asking the government to ban anything that's in existence what we're looking to do is ban these new type of products that are directly targeting youth from coming on the market uh, some of the ones we see in the states like liquid tobaccos being in development uh, among a number of other ones that are kind of gross and again haven't moved to Canada and youth don't want to see these coming here uh, the key message that uh, we're looking for, I just kind of covered that. Uh, the goals for this year, uh, ultimately we want to pass this federal legislation so that these products won't be allowed to come anywhere in Canada. Um, so we're working to get signatures signed. One of the big things we want to do this year is get 10,000 petitions signed uh, from different youth. Uh, so we've been getting out, getting the petition signed. I know we've got a few hundred already. And we want to grow the campaign to a national level, so one of the steps the youth have already taken is growing it from uh, a regional campaign to provincial. Again, this is something the youth care about and youth are able to take it on and kind of bring it forward and make it bigger. So a couple highlights. Uh, like I said, we've got a couple hundred per signatures signed. Uh, we got a whole bunch of likes on Facebook, which to most people, who cares, right? But to youth, that's a huge accomplishment. Uh, so we're very happy about that and growing this campaign again, social media and accessing some of those other means that we don't see with their traditional uh, protection or cessation campaigns targeted towards adults. We're trying to access them in kind of unique and original ways. So this will be another video and we're going to move on to our Smoke Free Movies campaign, so enjoy. If smoking were taking our children in misleading movies, I would grow up seeing my favorite movie stars be cool or tough without smoking. Not be able to name off cigarette brands based on what I have seen in movies. Avoid becoming addicted to tobacco because I wasn't exposed to hot screen smoking. In 2009, 1.1 billion tobacco impressions were delivered in children and youth rated films in Canada. Take a stand against smoking in movies. Great, so um, what you just saw was a PSA that was developed by, um, the script was written and starred in by a number of our youth advocates on the smoke-free movies issue. Smoke-free movies issue is part of the Ontario Coalition for Smoke-Free Movies and it really is uh, an aggressive public education and awareness raising campaign around um, the issue of smoking in movies and how much it directly links to tobacco use amongst youth. We know that the issue is, um, Oh, and I think I'm having some technical difficulties. Oh, here we go again. Uh, we know that the issue amongst smoking uh, in movies is a very real one for youth. We know that the more youth see smoking, the more they are likely to start. We also know, as was evidenced in the PSA, that um, youth make up a very large proportion of movie viewers. So they're seeing a lot of movies and so they're being delivered 1.1 billion tobacco impressions. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot about the policies that are already in existence and uh, movies remain one of the few venues that are still out there that normalize this tobacco industry product. Um, so there's a number of goals. It's not a campaign that's unique to here. It is a campaign that exists elsewhere and works off of the WHO solutions or suggestions um, to get smoking out of movies that are targeting uh, children and youth amongst a number of other, other key sort of solutions. Uh, what really makes this campaign unique is that there are upwards of 20 youth ambassadors. This is a, um, a campaign with youth and adult um, advocates who really are the face and the voice of the campaign uh, and through a number of their initiatives have garnered uh, over 6,000 supporters over the last uh, few years. They will be, just as a heads up, gearing up to do uh, some things around the Oscars, so do, um, do watch for those. The last one that we're going to highlight is uh, Flavor Gone, and so hopefully we can cue that video. Flavor Gone! Flavor Gone! Flavor Gone! Tobacco industry uses candy flavoring and colorful packaging to 
target children and youth. The problem is, is that the flavors that normally belong to fruit and candy are now in products that cause cancer. So that was another quick video uh, from another group of youth that, again, wanted to make a YouTube video, got it out there, uh, kind of showed a little bit about their campaign. Uh, cool thing about youth stuff is that, as you see there, sometimes you get to dress up in banana costumes and grape costumes and run around uh, chanting things. Uh, always fun in a youth campaign. Uh, so Flavor Gone was actually started in 2008. is one of the longest running uh, youth campaigns now. Um, so what they're looking to do is basically simply ban flavors in tobacco products. Uh, flavors, again, uh, just like Freeze the Industry would say, uh, specifically targeted to youth uh, and they don't need to be there. Again, uh, traditional tobacco users aren't using these flavored products. They're directly marketed to youth uh, and can also be easily considered as a gateway product. So you start using these different grape flavored products and eventually move to uh, the regular product because it's a nicotine addiction, uh, whether there's flavors in it or not. Yeah, and so their sort of uh, slogan is, you know, cancer shouldn't come in a candy wrapper. Um, and I think Kale spoke to a few of those issues. This group has had a lot of success through their youth-led initiatives with the passing of a federal bill, uh, C-32, and are now looking and building up a lot of momentum around closing some of the loopholes that existed um, with the, the earlier passed bill and looking to close some of those with, with amendments. The interesting thing about uh, this campaign is that they do have a bit of a, you know, a quote-unquote campaign in a box, uh, which really makes it easy and accessible for people to replicate. Um, and like Kale said, throw in some banana, you know, colored costumes or whatever. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's not just uh, just youth under those morph suits there. Uh, <laughs> when the face is covered, you know. Um, so again, it's another way to do uh, tobacco prevention in an interesting and exciting way. I don't think I should be in control of this clicker. <laughs> oh, I just got the credit for that one. <laughs> and one of the things I want to mention too, like we call these youth campaigns, and uh, it is an, obviously a large part of youth leading these all three of these campaigns, but a huge, huge part of it is all the support we have behind the adult allies, uh, the different uh, youth engagement specialists throughout the province that uh, are working with these youth uh, and kind of making sure that these campaigns are targeted. Uh, also provide all the resources to the health unit. So it's great what we're seeing done in prevention across Ontario right now. Uh, as you can see with these campaigns, highly, highly effective and it wouldn't be possible without all of our adult allies. Uh, I know a number of these campaigns also worked with tons of other different NGOs that uh, are likely in attendance today, the Canadian Cancer Society, uh, Physicians Smoke Free Canada. Again, youth are happy to partner uh, with adult allies at any point because, again, we know as youth, just like adults, uh, the best way to go forward in tobacco control is working together uh, and use cooperation, leverage all of our resources the best we can. Can, uh, because again we're working against a powerful industry. Uh, so first thing uh, just to kind of wrap things up, uh, youth uh, campaigns are obviously all about advocacy so they find an issue that matters to them, uh, they take that on, create a campaign and they want to make change. Uh, a big piece of that once they decide on an issue and something that makes them mad, flavors in tobacco, uh, the products and branding by the tobacco industry, once they say they don't like that, they want to get out and get other youth. So doing some of that grassroots uh, advocacy, uh, getting out and educating their peers, getting them behind the campaign uh, and kind of explaining to other youth what's happening to them, how they're being targeted and what they can do about it. Uh, so a big piece of it is not just providing that education so that they know uh, the dangers of tobacco because every youth will tell you that you, they know tobacco uh, is a harmful product. But again, it's doing something about that. So taking action on uh, what they feel is an issue, and that's a big piece of prevention, getting people involved in that. 
Uh, and last, again, to make change. So that's a big piece. Youth get to a point where we've chose and educated and all of us youth are really, we want a tobacco moratorium or we want flavors gone. Uh, and that's when it comes in to make the change. It's bringing in partners and doing this collaboration that we've been talking about throughout the day, uh, working with all of our different partners and seeing how they can help each other out throughout the campaign, whether it's uh, developing some of the legal side of that, uh, the different campaigns we're working, or uh, figuring out even it, asking questions, answering questions, and we've had, I'm sure, lots of adults uh, in morph suits, like you said, <laughs> helping out. Uh, it takes a little bit of confidence to put on a morph suit, but I can say I've also done it. <laughs> yeah, and then our last just kind of take home piece is, uh, you know, I think what we've really uh, wanted to present in this presentation is some of the unique components around tobacco industry denormalization, but also the importance of that coordinated piece around those prevention efforts and um, how those have been have been coordinated across the province and then just to sort of put it out there as kind of a, a final take-home piece around expansion and um, you know Kale talked a bit about the adult allies and the adult relationships but to put out you know what are the opportunities to expand uh, in terms of the different youth adult partnerships that we might move forward with when we think about um, looking to further our prevention efforts together as a group uh, in the future and that's that's us so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Sarah and Kale, very much. Um, and while I introduce our next two presenters, if they want to take a moment to uh, uh, change, take, take the previous speaker's advice and change into a morph suit, uh, <laughs> Peter or Donna or a banana costume, uh, just take your time. That would be fine. Um, so thank you very much, Sarah and Kale, for giving us an overview of tobacco industry denormalization as a, uh, as a strategy and how it can work to uh, both from a prevention lens and engagement lens for young people, in, both in terms of education and advocacy. Um, uh, very salient as well as giving uh, real life examples of what's been done around the province. So thank you. So our, our our next and our final uh, panelists today uh, are Donna Sukar from uh, the Canadian Cancer Society and uh, Dr. Peter Selby from the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Um, and uh, they're going to be talking about cessation, smoking cessation. So I'll introduce both of them and then uh, we'll welcome uh, Dr. Selby up first and then uh, Donna second. So. Um, uh, Peter Selby uh, is the Chief of Addictions and, and Clinician Scientist at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. He's an Associate Professor in the Departments of, Fac of Family and Community Medicine and Psychiatry, Family of Medicine, uh, Family, Faculty of Medicine, and the Dalla School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. You can tell that my uh, sickness is, uh, is taking effect. Uh, he's the Executive Director and Creator of the TEACH Project a continuing, continuing education certificate program in applied counseling for health with a focus on smoking cessation, um, and that's through the University of Toronto. Dr. Selby's research as a principal investigator at OTRU, the Ontario Tobacco Research Unit, includes, a smoking, cessa includes smoking cessation, especially in smokers with comor comorbid addictions. Um, as the principal investigator of the STOPS study, he studies the effectiveness of stop smoking interventions in different settings. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Selby. Thank you very much. Okay. Wow, so this is uh, post lunch at about 3 o'clock where approximately everybody's going to fall asleep. So we're going to try to keep this going. So welcome to everybody online. I was busy trying to tweet things as I was trying to multitask and I realize I'm getting old. I can't <laughs> multitask. I probably sent the wrong message or said the wrong thing, so I apologize. But um, uh, thank you very much. Anyway, so uh, we're going to talk about building a, an integrated cessation system, which uh, is, you know, uh, we can put a building together much faster than a system, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, the vision is obviously we want a tobacco-free Ontario by 2030. Hopefully we want it actually across Canada, but uh, since we're only talking about Ontario now, um, that's what we're looking for. Uh, tobacco is not done. 
and uh, it's it's fascinating that it, it, it I, I would love to see it done in my lifetime but I don't think it's done and I think we have to be careful when people start taking their focus off tobacco uh, we can see it actually resurge there's nothing to say that if you take away the co tobacco control efforts that this issue is, will be solved once and for all um, and so it's important for us to pay attention to this that although uh, I mean, you can look at the, you know, 2011 uh, CTAMS re uh, results, it'll say we have, you know, 17% and we're making great progress. And yes, we have, but it's not enough because we still have uh, a lot of current smokers and it's close to about 5 million. Uh, yes, there are fewer smokers than 99, but that doesn't mean uh, we're done. We still have uh, a fair proportion of the population who smoke. Yes, we've got some sort of softening happening that we have many more occasional smokers, but on the other hand, we do also have many more daily smokers. And in fact, pay attention to that population because that population is much more likely to have multiple comorbidities. Uh, and so they're much less likely to be eating their fruits and vegetables. They're much less likely to have, uh, you know, um, um, be, be in white collar jobs, they're much less likely to have finished high school, they're much more less likely to have 30 minutes of physical activity a day. So the smoker of today is not your, or the smoker that the tobacco industry wants you to think about is the, in the pink of health, running around, you know, um, extremely fit, wearing, uh, you know, white clothes and, and sailing a boat or riding a horse. These people are poor, huddled, uh, dealing, living in, in poverty, in stress, and, and, and that is not the picture that is often uh, portrayed. And so as we introduce interventions, we've got to make sure we don't have uh, intervention generated inequities whereby only those advantaged in society benefit uh, because we have an equal approach as opposed to an equitable approach. So here's something that kind of like an acid trip I would kind of try to <laughs> put up there but it's a flower and <laughs> uh, you know you can like you know if you squint your eyes you'll see things there but essentially what it's trying to the story it's trying to tell is that really we are we're tobacco users in the center of it and there's lots of players that need to come in to really make this work especially if you're going to pay attention to the various needs of uh, tobacco users so Although you m we might have high reach interventions that seem to be you know, scalable and can go across populations, uh, we are beginning to, to pay attention to that there are uh, populations within this group that require much more targeted interventions if we are gonna have, again, an equitable uh, approach to this. So there is a logic model which hopefully uh, people will follow, but I mean, you can't see it from here, but basically it really talks about the infrastructure interventions, the paths, and the outcome measures that we're really looking for to achieve this. And so uh, really we're starting with the end in mind. We've got a lot of uh, factors to do and it really speaks to the fundamentals of tobacco control and uh, in, in, in making this happen. When we talk about cessation, there are many ways in which people can stop. They can stop basically by, you know, by sort of secondhand approaches, which is just basically you change the norm in society and people stop because most people want to be fitting in with the norm. And so that's another, I mean, so policy interventions have a huge impact on cessation and cessation behaviors. Whether people stop completely, reduce, it does have an impact. Whether you smoke free places, price, what have you, extremely important. But it'll only get you so far. And then you have the issue of dealing with people who still might need assistance. And there are a variety of ways in which people can come into this door. And every opportunity we have to intervene with the smoker is, is, is a critical one. And whether this is done face to face at the, in the pharmacy, by phone, on the web, by text messaging, with counseling, with messaging, uh, with medications, everything adds up uh, and hopefully helps um, people quit smoking. There are several organizations involved in, 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 in cessation and they c c in, include both national and provincial organizations and I won't spend uh, too much time on this, but it's every, every professional group and every body part non-governmental organization, whether it's heart, lung, uh, cancer, everybody is interested in this, and, and rightly so, uh, because it is, when I go through and work with my colleagues in, in medicine, the, there is no subspecialty of medicine which isn't interested in s tobacco or tobacco cessation, because it affects the work they do. 
it affects the only group that isn't in, interested in cessation is the pathologist. It's primarily because the person's dead, so it doesn't help. But everybody else, there's, n there's not a single department in medicine or division of medicine that is not interested in this. So let's take a look at the few highlights. Canadian Cancer Society, leave the pack behind, the Ontario Tobacco Research Unit, CAMH has been doing some work, and then, of course, the Ottawa Model for Smoking Cessation, which is taking the <coughs> and mobilizing what we know from evidence, which is the five A's of uh, and mobilizing it into hospital-based cessation, uh, as well as having follow-up. So when it really is looking at a way for implementation uh, of the evidence base. When we take a look at the system design, it's like, you know, um, we've been designing the system for a while and it's, it's grown organically, but in 2007, many of us around the stable tried to put this simple idea forward. And uh, it was very simple that basically you started with the least intrusive and least intensive and kept moving further in, but making sure that people had the opportunity to enter at any point. And uh, we really looked at, at it as a sort of almost like an all of society approach with some key nodes whereby people could enter. Uh, of course, since we put this together, the government changed many times as is not will happen and the, there's been turnover of staff as well so that this historical work is, is become hi you know, it's history as opposed to current. And so it's gone through several um, other iterations and we've had another one which was led by uh, PHO which was the Smoke Free Ontario Scientific Advisory Committee recommendations and we have these recommendations on cessation uh, which really speaks to many of the same things which is a media campaign, tobacco use support system, direct support, cessation in, in other settings like workplaces etc, training in cessation, uh, the role of pharmaceutical companies and in innovative approaches that would be required to address um, the tobacco epidemic. They were also having, uh, you know, targets, and you can see they went across uh, all pillars of smoking, of tobacco control, but with cessation, if I can point out that out to you, is really increasing the proportion of smokers who make a quit attempt, because at a population level, the, more, the greater number of people who we can help make quit attempts, even though the e for each quit attempt, the success rate will be low, you know, maybe less than, between 3 to 10%, you'll end up with enough people who are long-term quitters. And so you start having this kind of um, uh, effect on the population. And so the greater number of quit attempts we can get people to make, the, greater, uh, the, the fewer smokers we'll have. We also want to increase the proportion of smokers uh, who, who, who quit smoking uh, stay quit for, for, uh, for, for the long term. There was a cessation task force, then, uh, you know, I'm skipping a few steps, but essentially uh, what we have currently is a cessation task force that really takes a look at uh, what needs to happen and, and what needs to be implemented. And so the task force creates consultation with stakeholders, really tries to uh, align uh, what this, the, 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 all the providers of cessation are doing and trying to integrate services across um, and taking a look at uh, how do we look at uh, making sure that all the players in cessation are working together? Of course, the other work that's going on, and I think Donna's going to speak a little bit about it, is that in coordinating this cessation pathways and the cessation system, what is often mis missing from tobacco control is the voice of the end user. Most other health conditions, for, such as HIV, AIDS, etc., has a very strong voice of the end user. And uh, in tobacco control, it, we really haven't had that voice, which means the relationship between the smoker and the tobacco industry continues. Uh, we've got to figure out how to break that up and have them c connect with us. And so really having these kinds of ways of connecting with smokers to understand what their needs are, what they want, uh, because they, vo they vote with their feet. There is no, it is by no mistake that they are going after e-cigarettes. And where are we on it? You know, we are coming up behind and we're going to have our first national debate about it now and e-cigarettes are already have been in the market they've already been bought out one company has already been bought out by a tobacco company others are potentially getting poised to be taken over so we are always behind the eight ball and we need to get ahead of these kinds of things so we need to have smokers who are telling us early on they don't show up in national population surveys they get missed but we need to have feet on the ground ears and eyes on the ground to where smokers are at and what are they doing and how can we uh, how can we become and develop that relationship with them. So, 
essentially through O2 what we are finding out on, on street intercepts and other methodologies is that people use multiple resources. They're not using any one single resource to quit smoking. Um, there are inconsistencies with, with which health care, pro pro care provider they'll go to, but they'll go to a, a ton of them, including their primary care provider. Uh, of course, the biggest problem is not knowing what is available. It is, and if you take, if we actually asset map what we have in Ontario and Canada, we have one of the best elements of a cessation system. Where we, uh, one of our big problems is the lack of a mass media campaign to in educating the public of what they can do when they're ready to quit. Uh, there's needs for a, a system navigation hub, and of course, there's always a desire for a tailored quit plan. So no. Sm what we've often done is given everybody equal treatment and we, re we know that that is not going to be effective because every smoker we see is different. Um, and so we need to figure out how to tailor their, uh, their help. Uh, we also need a system navigation hub because most people find it extremely confusing. Imagine if you had to navigate that flower. It's, it's extremely difficult to do that. And so we need really simple pathways uh, that smokers can take uh, and, and, and navigate. It doesn't have to be very difficult. Currently, when we take a look at our system, and some of you may have seen this slide of mine before, is this is what we have. Each individual component here is perfectly engineered and works really well. You know, the problem is this is how the person has to look at this. And it, when you look at it this way, it doesn't get us anywhere. What we really need is something like this. And we should aim for a Ferrari in, in tobacco control. You know. If we can not think twice about investing in an MRI scanner or a, a, the new cardiac cath lab, why can't we have the Ferrari of cessation systems? And until we ask ourselves that and demand it, we want to get it. Because if we compromise and say, oh, well, we'll just have the mini mouse system, you know, we'll just have the little cheaper system. Why should we have a cheaper system? Because this is going to get us on that racetrack and, and win the race. You know. You're not going to get across that racetrack in a Jetta. Nothing wrong with a Jetta, but it's good enough if you want to commute in the city. But if we want to take this on as a big challenge in a race, you, we need a Ferrari. And, you know, it's cost effective to have a Ferrari for a race on a big racetrack. So, how do we get that? How do we have the logos instead of, you know, John play a special on that, Smoke Free Ontario on it? So that's where we are with the cessation system. It is still getting together. We are still the engineers trying to figure out how to make this into that. <laughs> so we need everybody's help and we need to come together uh, because uh, otherwise we're going to feel like we're on junkyard wars, right? Making this racing car from uh, pieces. But we're, we're going to make this happen. So thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you Peter, very much. Um, next up to talk about how we create an integrated cessation system, the Ferrari, uh, so to speak, is Donna Sukar. Uh, I have the pleasure of working with Donna at the Canadian Cancer Society where she's the uh, Senior Director of su Support Programs and uh, she leads the Society's Smokers Helpline um, and uh, their, that su set of support programs as well as services that enhance the life, uh, quality of life of those living with cancer. Uh, Donna coordinated the team that created Smokers Helpline in 99 uh, and she continues to be responsible for its oversight, development and evaluation as well as the Driven to Quit challenge. Additionally, Donna is responsible for the uh, Society's Cancer Information Service in Ontario, uh, its peer support programs that serve several provinces and its community-based transportation service. Donna's career began in a small business in small business and evolved to voluntary and nonprofit sector organizations with program leadership and management studies completed at McMaster University. Pleasure to welcome Donna Sukar. Thank you. Thanks, John. And thanks, Peter. Peter started out our presentation, and I hope to continue on without being too repetitious. It's a little hard when you're the last speaker. That will either be very boring, or perhaps it will just give so much reinforcement that we'll all walk away with something from this. Um, I wanted to also just acknowledge uh, Peter and his contributions as co-chairing the Cessation Task Force in Ontario with Laura Pisco. We're really lucky. I think there's not a person working in Cessation who doesn't know Peter Selby. and. Um, I think we're very fortunate to have that ongoing leadership to actually start moving things forward even more. 
So I have let me get this straight, subtitled my presentation is linking supply and demand because that's kind of the some of the language that we've been gun using when we're talking about cessation and it really just adds a dimension beyond the pillars approach of protection, prevention and cessation. Uh, of how do we think about supply uh, or how do we link supply which is the programs, the services, the medications that are available with demand which is tailoring the messaging and the availability to improve access and to be there for people so that they can find what they want, where they want it and when they want it. You know, lots of us are involved in providing good programs and services, but if we want to increase our impact, we are going to have to get more engagement and more utilization. On a systems level, we need to create the linkages between the places that people go and the various kinds of services that they access. And then we also need to engage directly with people who smoke so that they'll seek meaningful help to quit. The system linkages are improving and it's encouraging to see that bridges are being built between clinical and community partners and I think this is actually quite a big step forward. And I have a few examples, Peter referenced some of them, but to give a bit more detail, uh, programs like the Ottawa model reach a highly relevant target. There's a large number of people who smoke who go to hospitals and healthcare settings and highly addicted people. So they are able to initiate smoking with a very relevant, I'm sorry, initiate cessation with a very relevant audience. And then they're working with partners that can provide community-based referrals so that they can, the support can be ongoing and follow-up can be provided. A STOP demonstrated value in its ma mass distribution model that we're all familiar with and then on an ongoing basis they're working with health and community partners where they're initiating cessation attempts and that those can be fulfilled through medication and counseling strategies. Leave the pack behind we know about it reaches thousands of post-secondary students every year on campuses and they also are making community referrals so that there's ongoing support and we're getting that we're you know, trying to build that seamlessness that we'd like to see in a system. Um, programs like Smokers Helpline, Public Health Units, Pharmacists and other services are widely available as referral sources for these various programs. And of course, each of them, I, I'm sorry, of course, I wanted to say that TEACH is also an enabler because the education and the teaching that goes behind these programs is consistent throughout. Uh, TCANs are bringing people together in uh, bringing programs and providers together and are well coordinated in ways that can make things relevant for their own communities and the communities that they serve. The professional associations are being engaged uh, through various task forces and relationships so that they ensure that disciplines are represented and contributing. I put a few on the slide, but there's of course more like the Ontario Dental Association, the RNAO. Um, we're all becoming aware of how partners are promoting health messaging and services that, that allows us to get more out of campaigns. So whether it's direct to smokers or to the pro providers and the influencers that they interact with, we can generate awareness and it needs to have a call to action and that again is going to help people make forward, move forward. So some of the examples were things like Driven to Quit and Quit and Get Fit when they were funded. There was a lot of cross uh, promotion that went on in them. Also You Can Make It Happen, Don't Quit Quitting are big ones, but there's a lot of smaller um, local campaigns as well that are working together with providers and messaging that's getting out there. So what's new? Um, you know, so far I've provided a brief overview of what many of us know to be available on the supply side and how working together can increase demand. But there's also some newer initiatives on the cessation agenda. Last year, the long-awaited uh, graphic warning labels that increased the sizes, size of images with health messaging and a quit line phone number and website on tobacco packaging were introduced. Um, OTRU has the Smokers Panel Initiative that Peter mentioned and the idea there is that we're going to be able to recruit current and former smokers to a panel where they can be engaged so we can offer services to them, provide advice and participate in research. The pharmacists now have an expanded role in counseling and providing medications for people to quit. In January of 2012 there was expanded coverage and medication for people undergoing addictions treatment. 
The healthcare collaborations are expanding and the ministry has funded some workplace demonstration projects that are about to get underway. So these are all new ways of reaching out and, and usually involve people working together so that it's a more complete spectrum. Just a couple of examples of the things I was referencing. This shows the new, an example of the new warning labels. Shows that the quitline phone number is there and there's a website that people can access. If they go to the uh, web access, they are presented with a map of Canada and they can find the province that they are um, going to be served by. Based on the learnings from other countries, the Smokers Helpline call volume and uh, online registrations were expected to increase by 100 to 200 percent in the first year, which is pretty much has been what's happened. And we know, though, that we also have to continue our promo promotion efforts because the volume is expected to gradually taper and stabilize in years two and three. mentioned the smokers panel and it's being supported by partner organizations who are going to promote it through their channels and recruit participants through their cessation programs so things like postcards e-banners e-cards are going to be available and people can organizations can incorporate it into their messaging but i think what's really impressive about this is it's going to become a very valuable way of reaching out to people because as the more the channels are expanded the more the reach is going to be expanded and there's going to be new demographics of people that are brought into the system and linked up together and will be able to reach out to. So I think it's going to be a very um, interesting and valuable exercise. And as I mentioned um, earlier as well, that in October the government announced the funding of expanded services by pharmacists and I know a lot of organizations are really working, uh, trying to reach out more and bring pharmacists into the various strategies that we are working with. So what's next? Um, you know, the list of what's available does sound very impressive and as Peter showed, we have slides with lots of names and programs and organizations on them. Uh, and we do all need to be working together more um, if we want to lower the rate of tobacco use in Ontario. So really what's next is up to all of us. Whatever role it is that we play, we need to do more of it and we need to do more of it with each other. And I think really now, um, I posed some questions on here, but I think we're probably gonna go back to the questions that, that John posed for this session overall. Um, but you know, how we can work together more, improving the system, integrating more. And I think um, as we go to the bigger picture questions, they will go beyond cessation and show how we can bring all of the pieces together. So thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. <clears throat> so now we are going to uh, we're going to bring these questions back up. Uh, so again, um, contrary what you've heard from all of the speakers today is uh, um, is underlining that tobacco is not done. Uh, we still have lots of work left to do in the field of tobacco protection, uh, cessation, and prevention. Um, so uh, do we have the phone lines open? So what I would like to do is open it up to the audience who's here in the room, the audience uh, on the phone, and the audience uh, who's joined us online, um, that they can either ask questions of our panelists. Uh, you can either ask questions of our panelists and they'll come up and answer, provide their answers, or you can, and, and if you're in the room, I will repeat your questions so you don't have to come up to the mic. Um, and then um, if you also have a comment with regards to what are the main action steps needed over the next two years for all of us or for government or for research or what role the um, alliance can play. Um, please share those and, uh, and also what are the major challenges and, and barriers and how we can reduce them as we move forward. So without further ado, you are now off mute um, and I would like to, I know we have Twitter um, and questions that can come through Adobe Connect um, as well. So um, perhaps we'll start with uh, the room. Uh, are there any questions or comments in terms of next, next steps and what we, where we need to go and what we need to do uh, or questions for the presenters?
Yes, Joanne. So I'm just thinking about things that we often um, get asked when we're um, talking to the media about tobacco control and, and uh, tobacco control in this province. And there's often the question that comes up about um, why don't we just ban it? Why don't we just ban tobacco, right? So I think um, at some point, I think we just need to start having that conversation um, more at tables like this and about how we respond to that question. And, you know, do we, are, is there a gradual move that way? Is there, is there, uh, is that uh, an appetite within government? Is it something that we are looking to uh, talk to government about? Um, you know, are there other jurisdictions that are, are having far more success in, in that arena than us? So that sort of thing. Great, so I'm gonna try and paraphrase that and you can tell me if I've missed anything. But uh, the question was, uh, the issue, I think, was, you know, as we speak to the media and we engage in a public dialogue, either uh, with citizens um, in Ontario or more broadly, or we're engaging uh, discussion, discussions with government, um, and the question comes to us of why don't we just ban tobacco, um, uh, sh you know, a number of questions were posed. Should we be entertaining it? Um, how do we respond to it? Um, should we be engaging government in this kind of uh, question? Um, and perhaps this is something that we need to, to begin talking about in these kinds of for, uh, forums, or for I, um, uh, and entertain uh, where we might go uh, with, with this question. So would any of our panelists, brave panelists, like to uh, respond? Michael, Burley? Yeah, I, th I think this is the elephant in the room for all of us. Um, I've been spending some time on this over the last few years, as have others. Um, I think to, to start with, um, what is the knee-jerk response when we bring this up? Um, let me tell you what I've heard. Uh, oh, prohibition didn't work on alcohol in the 20s. Um, well, uh, alcohol is quite a different uh, substance and a different consumer product with different risks, not as pronounced as tobacco. It has its own risks. The 20s are not the 2013s. Uh, we know a hell of a lot more about public health and have a much more highly developed infrastructure and awareness in the public now about tobacco and its, uh, the evils that it, that it creates in society. And it has no safe level of use, which alcohol does have. So they're very, very different substances, and we're not talking about bringing in a statute next year. Um, the usual thing is, oh well, if you get if you if you uh, if you try and ban tobacco, there'll be uh, uh, prohibition didn't work. Well, nobody's suggesting we do it in in a year or two. Uh, there'll be a huge black market. Well, um, there already is a black market <laughs> with contraband product. And, uh, and again, no one is suggesting, I think, when we talk about the ban, which we need to do, uh, because we're being asked, as Joanne said, we're being asked about it by the media. We're not bringing it up uh, because public health has traditionally been uh, unwilling to raise this um, for the reasons I mentioned. And then, well, it's really hard on smokers. It's not fair to smokers to suddenly cut off their product. Well, no one's suggesting that we do that. We have a wide variety of medications, counseling services, as Peter and Donna described. Many, many interventions are there. They're not all linked together. We've got work to do. But um, we have a wide, wide array of tools to help people quit. What we don't do is promote them. We don't link the system together, and we're not promoting them. Um, I've seen in, in a couple of American jurisdictions um, where if you're driving on the highways, for example, in New York State, you will see very large uh, quit smoking billboards promoting the state's cessation system. And you'll see ads on TV and so on. We don't see any of that here because there is no large scale concentrated focused promotion. There are all kinds of interventions. We have a telephone number for the smokers helpline on every cigarette package now, but we're not promoting that online or in traditional media. So we have a huge opportunity to create a much bigger cessation environment and pave the way. 10 years, we could debate. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the road, getting to, is it zero? Do we want to get to no tobacco can be used? No tobacco can be sold? No tobacco can either be used or sold? 
um, what is is zero zero or is it one percent or two percent virtual uh, elimination so there are a lot of questions that have uh, to which a lot of people have given a lot of thought and not to have a strategy for I'm I'm just suggesting from the work we've done probably 15 to 20 years out of getting as close to zero as we can arrive at that reasonable people can disagree on the percentage but is it totally zero I think that's probably unrealistic for several reasons uh, because if Ontario quote unquote were to do it we would be doing it uh, in the absence of many other surrounding jurisdictions so there would be an influx problem which we would have to deal with but the point is to get a jurisdiction to act on this to set a target to set a strategy to let and most smokers will tell you thank you we heard from many many smokers during the smoke free debates thank you for making places smoke free it I've been trying to quit but I every time I go into a bar uh, I get hit with a cloud of smoke every time I go to a convenience store I see a wall of cigarettes I can't when even if I do quit I'm constantly re-triggered to start again. So making the environment smoke free and having a cessation strategy that reaches out 10 to 15 to 20 years and an anti-industry denormalization strategy that reaches out 10 to 15 to 20 years and a taxation strategy, all these things together. Uh, but so far we have not found a government with the courage to do that because they're afraid of appearing too big brotherish, big sisterish, nanny state, all that stuff. And in fact, uh, the public and the media are ahead of us on this one. And uh, we need to be a lot more aggressive on it. It's quite designable, it's doable. Uh, we need to be setting the benchmarks for how it's done. And so far, the community as a whole, the public health community has not done that. And government has shied away. So we continue to debate, but we're not taking a, a focused, proactive step to do it. Thank you, Michael. Uh, any other uh, of the speakers who would like to weigh in on that question? Did Michael cover it well? We'll move on to the next question. Um, in the room or on the phone uh, or online, do we have any questions online? We have a comment. We have a comment online. Sorry, just one second. We can take the mic, yes. You can just do it. Yeah. So this comment comes from Porcupine Health Unit Tenants, and it's a cessation topic. One major barrier in cessation is equitable access to effective treatments without the financial barrier. Could one solution be to have NRT provide free to all our, uh, sorry, to have NRT provided free to all health units, healthcare professionals, not just FHT? So no matter who your HCP is, clients would have access to free NRT. Did everybody hear that on the phone? You can respond, it's off mute. Did you hear it on the phone? No. No. So the question I believe was um, around access to nicotine replacement therapy um, because of um, inequities that, uh, that exist in our society um, and being able to help all those in need um, so the question uh, was about supporting availability of nicotine replacement therapy beyond uh, public health units, beyond um, family health teams, uh, and broadening to all healthcare professionals um, was the question. So who would like to handle that question? Peter. I'm assuming you heard that on the phone now? Yeah, thank you. Good, thanks. So, yeah, that's a great uh, question. The issue is um, funding and uh, making it available. In fact, it was based on what we did at STOP, which was making the NRT available by phone and mail, um, that the BC government has deployed its program. And, and like we predicted, they've, I think in the short time that they've run the the nicotine replacement distribution system to all uh, BC residents, it's been like, what, 150,000 have been reached? So, um, so yeah, it's doable. It's not a lack of knowing what to do. It's the act about ability to take action. I think that's the issue. Um, so, you know, where you make um, NRT available, it's 
there are many options that you could do. Each one has pros and cons, and there's a cost involved. Um, is it perfect currently? No, but certainly does uh, does get to the population uh, uh, with respect. I mean, I was surprised when I was we were going into family health teams that maybe we'd be just getting the word well. But I can tell you, based on what we're getting, we're fifty percent of the people accessing uh, nicotine replacement have a history of mental health or addictive disorder. Most of them are underemployed uh, or living in poverty. So it's not as if we are only getting the you know people who could who could have gotten gotten this otherwise. So uh, so there are pros and cons, and clearly it would be great to have public health units. We're doing something currently with one of the public health units, but I can tell you. Going to public health unit to public health unit means we deal with each legal team. And each legal team has its own ideas about what is and isn't possible. And uh, we've had a stop actually with family health teams and with uh, public health units in the past. Uh, but the uptake was so spotty, uh, primarily because each public health unit is independent. They could decide whether they want to or not. And so, um, or they can decide whether they're going to pull a staff member away from a from an intervention or not. And um, it's very difficult to build a cessation system where this is not seen as core business. Um, and so, we have to figure out how to get uh, public health to see this as a core business, core purpose, or why they of one of the reasons. I mean, I cannot imagine there would be any public health unit in Ontario which could say, yeah. We'll get other people to provide immunization. We're not in the business of doing that. Um, you know, to me, it's fundamental that uh, tobacco cessation should be offered by every public health unit in this province. Uh, how do we get to that? That's that's the challenge. Thank you, Peter. We have a follow-up comment. Do you want to just come to the mic, sir? So this is a response from Porcupine Health Unit Timmins. There are still FHT who could have access to free NRT, but who choose not to. So the so the pen, yeah so the penetration in FHTs has been at about seventy five percent of all sites have taken on, and the ones that haven't, uh, we're still working on them. We haven't given up, and um, there are ways in which we will. Uh, work with them to make sure that it is available um, and clearly this is where I think public health can uh, can help uh, we've had that kind of um, uh, advocacy by public health in uh, in Toronto where many family health teams were not uh, signing up in the first round but Toronto Public Health actually garnered and went in and uh, created that so we'll be quite happy to work with Porcupine Health Unit or any other health unit that knows of uh, family health teams that are not, uh, you know, having difficulty joining in. We've had similar experiences in other jurisdictions, Peterborough, et cetera, and they have come online. So, and a, a lot of it has to do with clarification, understanding what it involves. And, um, you know, I think once people get going, they start seeing the results, their patients actually thank them uh, for doing this, then they start really finding that this is not as onerous as they thought it would be. And in fact, you know, I can't imagine any health any any healthcare provider saying, "Well, you know what? We're just going to give up doing blood pressure. It's too much trouble. Uh, we're just not going to do that." You know, even though this could uh, save lives, as you know, because as we, we what we try to get across and try to get people to understand is that for every two smokers that they help quit, they'll save one life. There's nothing else that they do in that day that'll have that kind of impact. So if they want to work. To make a difference, then that's something that they they can't. How do they how do they go to go home at night, thinking that they could have saved uh, a life and not have acted? So I think getting that culture shift in healthcare is where we need to get to as well. Thank you, Peter. Uh, question from the audience. Uh, question for Michael. Um, we're looking at our advocacy priorities for the 2013 year for our public facing volunteer teams. And outdoor smoke free and flavors are really at the top of the list. Um, if you had to prioritize one over the other, what would be your recommendation? So the question was uh, from somebody at the Canadian Cancer Society uh, was in trying to prioritize advocacy priorities uh, in the coming year, um, smoke free outdoor spaces and 
flavored, flavored tobacco um, has keeps rising to the top. Uh, so if they were to have to choose between the two issues to focus on, what would they, ch what would they, or what should they choose? Well, I think I think that's a relatively easy one. I'd go with flavors because, um, and it's not just a question of fixing the existing legislation to deal with little cigars. Um, what we'd like to see happen is a ban on all flavored products. Well, let's just think about what we get there. We get chewing tobacco, we get cigars, we get blunts, we get wraps. Um, there's a debate over menthol right now. The feeling is menthol is sort of a separate issue. It's a flavoring, but it's a little bit tangential for various reasons. Long, long history of menthol product in the marketplace versus a lot of these flavored products are relatively new, so they don't, they can't really argue they've got any sort of legal grounds of non-regulation for many years. So flavored products for sure. I think outdoor spaces, uh, I'm not arguing against them so much uh, as saying, you know, a lot of municipalities are handling that already. They may call on cancer, heart and stroke, lung, others to deputize occasionally, as we're going to have to in Peel in a couple of weeks. But in terms of needing to really weigh in and get a campaign going, the municipalities, uh, again, they call on us. Uh, in the nonprofit sector to help out occasionally, but they don't need us to initiate campaigns. And um, I, th I think the push for that uh, is a lot easier, if you like, than the push for flavors. Because anytime you talk to governments these days about banning anything, they get they they get nervous. Um, and flavors, we've really got to get rid of them. Uh, there's no justification uh, in the adult world. Uh, for maintaining flavored products. Uh, I think uh, Melody Tilson, when she was talking about e-cigarettes this morning, she was talking about flavors like bubble gum. Uh, I know there are little cigars flavored uh, apple teeny, cranberry, cherry. I mean, these are not flavors that 35-year-old construction workers who like a chew occasionally are really looking for. That's not what they, what they want. So uh, the flavored products, uh, and the survey data bears this out, are really... Uh, uh, still in use by kids. They're a nice way to entice kids into the into the full-scale market. Uh, so definitely choose flavors. Can I have a follow-up question to that? Yeah, follow-up question. So with flavoring, uh, Michael, are there issues? That, will this also apply to things like shisha and yeah. e-cigarettes as well? So the question um, was, um, would this ban on flavoring apply to things such as shisha or hookah? And, and even the e because the e cigarettes and e cigarettes. E cigarette in Canada cannot be sold with tobacco, which means they have these other. They can't be sold with yeah. nicotine. I'm uh, yeah. sorry, with nicotine. Sorry. Yeah. E, e cigarettes cannot be sold with nicotine, but they are selling them with flavored cartridges. Um, so I'll let Michael answer. Yeah, I think on, on the e cigarette piece first. Uh, as, as Melody said, I think this morning, whatever Health Canada may say or, or, or dictate about e-cigarettes, it's on paper only. There's no enforcement at all. So anyone who buys an e-cigarette paraphernalia here can get a, a nicotine cartridge either uh, down the street from their local convenience store, and the convenience stores all know where to send them, or online. So uh, there's plenty of nicotine cartridge e-cigarette users. Um, they are all flavored. Um, the argument is the same uh, with shisha. Uh, the folks in Toronto who want to have herbal shisha bars licensed and the City of Toronto's licensing committee is thinking about doing that. God forbid, because once we license these uh, products, we know perfectly well that most shisha users want nicotine. Uh, they smoke uh, shisha for the nicotine content. There are a minority that don't. Um, so, uh, given the, the, the relationship between all uh, these, uh, uh, we definitely want to include shisha in the category. Whether you can, whether you can include uh, a non-tobacco-based product, even though it has nicotine in it, in a provincial or municipal bylaw, or a provincial law very easily, uh, there may be an issue there, uh, but ideally we'd like to get flavors out of anything, certainly that has nicotine in it. That would be the ideal. Yeah, but then you'll get pharmaceutical grade too, right? Because they have fruit flavored gum and what have you, right? 
Yeah, but uh, those are medicinal. They're they're uh, regulated a different different way under the uh, uh, I was going to say the FDA, but Health Canada, the Food and Drugs Branch here, regulates them differently. Uh, so it might be that there would be an exemption for products that are that are approved under federal law here um, that are purely uh, smoking cessation based, as opposed to the non-approved product. And the tobacco-based products certainly. I mean, the main well, thing is to get them out of tobacco-based products. If they make a health claim, then they could be exempted. Uh, right, right. If they make a health claim, they can be exempted. Pardon me? Legally make a health claim. Yeah. Approved health claim. Yeah. Not just any health claim. Yeah, they have to make it, it, the, the health claim that they make, say for Nicorette, has to be approved by Health Canada. But any product of that type presumably could have flavors remain in them. But any other products, specifically tobacco-based products, done, yeah. should be. Okay, so I just got the five-minute warning, and it's uh, depending on which clock you look at, it's either uh, three minutes or five minutes. So we will, I believe there's one more question from uh, online, um, and then we will wrap up and call it a day. Oh, and there's an in-person question. So I think we have time for one more, sorry. This, well, this question is from our Twitter feed from David Patterson. Given the rise in age 19 to 24 years smoking, would a province-wide tobacco-free post-secondary campuses initiative be desirable? Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> <laughs> so all the speakers and others nodded their head yes. So. That was quick. That was unanimous. So uh, there's a question in the, in the room. Yes. Um, Dr. Selby in the room, I'd love to know um, e-cigarettes as a valid cessation tool. So the question is, uh, for, for Dr. Selby, is, uh, is there any room for e-cigarettes uh, to be a valid uh, cessation tool? So wow. come on up, okay, so Peter. Uh, where's that rule? I'm going to just have to have So here's the thing that... Uh, I think it's too early to say yes or no because what we do need is the if it is going down a cessation aid kind of path then it does need to go through the same regulatory uh, safety ways which would for any other medication you know so we've got to make sure that the, the whole system itself is like a, a safe device for people to use that it doesn't you know combust by itself, it doesn't burn people's lips. It does, so all those things that it, with, with product of a health device, it should go undergo that kind of thing because it is something that people use repeatedly. Uh, so, so that is certainly one piece that it would require. The second thing is that the quality control in each of the cartridges need to then demonstrate that it is giving people a fixed exposure uh, of what they say. So one day they can't get six milligrams and the other day one milligram or two milligrams. There's got to be this consistency. So that's just from a, you know, making sure quality control and that it doesn't have contaminants, right? It doesn't have uh, other carcinogens that or other contaminants that, that go in it. The other thing is to establish the safety of uh, PG, which is propylene glycol, when inhaled. Now propylene glycol is, we ingest it it's in, on all sorts of things and uh, and in essence, uh, smokers are actually exposed to uh, to that because it uses a humectant in, in tobacco, so they are getting some exposure to PG anyway. Uh, and you want to make sure that the PG is good quality; it's not contaminated with diethylene glycol, which is poisonous. Uh, so, so those kinds of things would re be required before you can even put this for a good clinical trial to see if, in fact, it works for cessation or not. If you're going down a medical pathway. If you go down another public health pathway, which is very common in Canada for other substances of abuse, like injection heroin users or crack users, where people have, you know, so we've got a good example of using, you know, clean needles and giving people injection uses clean needles, and so you don't land up. So there's no, you know, a commitment to stopping drug use, but basically you're preventing HIV and Hep C and all those kinds of things. Uh, so that, but then you can say, well, that those needles actually go through pharmaceutical grade sterilization and they're, they're good quality. But on the other hand, we have bleach kits in public health that are used, or we've had things like uh, a crack 
pipe kits, which basically had Pyrex glass and, and tubes put together by many public health units and handed out to crack users. So in essence, I, the current state of affairs, e-cigarettes would be, the handing out an e-cigarette as a way to help people in many ways would be similar to, I think, a crack pipe kit kind of thing because you really don't know the quality of all the ingredients there right now. Does it hold promise? I think absolutely it does, but we need to be able to, we need to, Health Canada needs to unshackle Canadian researchers to study it. Right now, there's no way for us to study it. None. I mean, unless you're willing to give us a billion dollars, but who has that? Right. The other thing that plays into your response is the fact that you said one of the big tobacco companies has bought into one of these cigarettes. Sort of as a manufacturer, a holder of manufacturing. Yeah, so, so the call. a new purpose, right? Repurposing an industry. Yeah, so, but you know, repurposing, I mean, uh, <laughs> repurposing of industries is, is, is a common thing that occurs. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry is rife with being repurposed. I mean, when we we're just teaching a course on, on addictions, and, you know, we have the Bayer heroin, and we have the, you know, Park Davis marijuana, you know, all those the, uh, cocaine tooth drops. It, history is littered with these kinds of things, so it's not uncommon. But it's through regulation that these things either make their way into becoming and developing new products that are safer for people to use, or you let the status quo go. So, so the, the comment that uh, Dr. Selby was responding to was um, about the tobacco industry acquiring uh, one of these e-cigarette companies and uh, what the actual uh, regulation challenges or, or considerations would need to be when an industry is I'm getting a five minute, minus five minute uh, <laughs> uh, warning. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, everybody uh, for attending today, both um, on the phone, online, uh, virtually, in person. Um, uh, what I'd like to point uh, point you to is to is to the Ontario Chronic Disease Prevention Alliance's uh, website. So uh, after today's presentation, um, there will be a link on the main page to today's uh, live stream, so you can watch it again or pass it on to colleagues um, uh, that didn't weren't able to see it. There also will be uh, summaries um, uh, and uh, presenter bios, etc also posted on the site that you can um, you can access. Um, on the OCDPA site there's a frequently asked questions where you can take a look um, at OCDPA, um, its members, its partners, how you become a member, um, that kind of thing and uh, what its activities are, our activities. And we will um, be uh, releasing our next newsletter called Dialogue in March uh, of this year. Um, and additionally, as part of these panel discussions, we have uh, two more. One in um, March is nutrition, and we have the, the actual date for that is then March 18th uh, for nutrition. And for physical activity, we have May the 3rd. Um, so you can go on to OCDPA's website um, or contact us at OCDPA at ophia.org and uh, you can find more information there. So I just want to thank you uh, on behalf of the Canadian Cancer Society and the uh, Ontario Lung Association, um, Health Nexus and OFIA who provided a lot of technical support. Uh, lots went into making today's session happen and also thank you to uh, those in attendance and the presenters who came to participate today. Um, many thanks and uh, have a great day. Safe tra travels home if you're traveling home. <laughs>